Here we are at Düsseldorf with a new sailing star. Yeah, well, what I did was um, become the youngest person to sail solo, non-stop and unassisted around the world. So uh, I finished the voyage last May at age 16, um, now 17. Uh, how many days were you at the ocean? 210 days, so just over um, eight months. Um, and yeah, Ups and downs around the world, down under the capes. Um, yeah. And you sailed uh, non-stop? It was non-stop and unassisted, so non-stop without any stops, Sydney to Sydney and unassisted. Uh, I couldn't take on board food or supplies or anything if I broke something. And, and which route did you follow? From Sydney, uh, I sailed out across the Pacific Ocean and up to the equator, uh, rounded a little island uh, in the northern uh, hemisphere, the Lion Island group, uh, and headed back south under Cape Horn, which is quite notorious, a uh, huge milestone across the South Atlantic Ocean, uh, under the Cape of Good Hope, uh, across the Indian Ocean and home. And uh, the last leg was probably one of the worst. Uh, coming back under Australia, we had lots and lots of storms. Uh, it was very tough. Okay, and what kind of boat did you sail? Uh, my boat uh, was Pink Lady, Alice Pink Lady, she's called. Uh, she's an SNS 34, Sparkman and Stevens 34. So a very, very strong boat, uh, just known for being extremely tough. Uh, and it was bright pink as well, so very cute. <laughs> But it's quite a little small boat. It was. It's only a small boat, but um, any bigger I would have struggled to handle her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm only so strong, so we chose a boat that was slow and, and steady, um, but easy for me to handle and very, very tough. What kind of training did you do? How did you prepare for a voyage like that? Of course, there was lots and lots of training, lots of preparation, a lot more than people realised. Um, I dreamt about sailing around the world when I was 11 uh, and ever since then I was working towards it. So pretty much since I was 14 I was just sailing um, full time and preparing. Uh, I had almost 10,000 nautical miles of sea time before I left uh, and just all sorts of um, things. We lived on a boat as a family so it's not just sailing you have to know. It's how to fix every system on board the boat, how to navigate all these different things. What about education? You're a young person. Uh, yeah. do you, can you do a school, school as well? Yeah, well, I was doing distance education while I was at sea, so correspondence school. Um, but of course, I didn't get a lot done. Uh, so I should be finished school halfway through this year. So you're still at school? Yes, still at school. It's a bit different to normal school, <laughs> but yes. Okay. Um, there's been some uh, discussion about uh, young people setting new records. And now this is the, the Dutch girl trying to set a new record. Uh, how do you look on that? Uh, to start with, I think uh, Laura you're talking about is... Yeah. Um, quite a different record, very different voyage, different record. Um, but of course, you know, sailing around the world is a, a big, scary and a dangerous thing to be doing. So you can understand why people are concerned. Um, but I know for me, what I was told over and over again before I left was the importance of preparation to get everything perfect before you leave. Your experience, your boat, the team of people around you, that's what was more important than any age. But uh, it's not my place to say. What do you think a uh, 14-year-old can do that? I don't, I don't think, you know, it's experience, not yeah. age. It's very much experience, not age. But I don't think that somebody who was too young and too inexperienced wouldn't get the support they needed to do a voyage like this. To do a voyage like this, you need a lot of support um, from team, uh, financial, lots of support. So unless that a lot of people, experienced people, had every confidence in you, you wouldn't get the support you needed. What about... Um we probably had to do some uh, big decisions on board. Did you have any tough decisions uh, like uh, weather systems yeah. or failure? Did you have uh, t contact with the people on, on land? Yeah, there was. There was, you know, lots of <laughs> challenges along yeah. the way and decisions to make. And I did have. I was very lucky. Like a uh, modern sailor, you know, the satellite communications uh, is very good. Um, so I was able to talk to my team back home and when I had an electrical problem I was able to get some advice or how maybe how, some advice on fixing the engine, uh, on weather systems, and weather routing. But when it came down to it, it was my decision at the end of the day, but it was very, very good to have that advice. How, how was your typical day on board? Uh, well, the thing I love about it is that there was no typical day. No two days were ever the same. There was always a new challenge or uh, something new, um, which is what makes sailing so incredible. Um, some days you would be just completely busy uh, dealing with a storm, nothing but sort of survival. Uh, other times there was nothing to do, the boat sails itself, so you cook and you sleep and you read and uh, there's always something to fix, always maintenance, so I can say I'd never got bored. 
Did you get a good night's sleep? No, you don't just get a good night's sleep. Um, when you're at sea by yourself, you only ever sleep for 20 minutes or 40 minutes and very rarely a couple of hours at a time uh, and sometimes a little bit longer. Um, you have alarms to wake you up if anything changes and you quickly pop your head up, check everything and go back to sleep. It sounds really harsh, but your body gets used to it and you can sleep like this. Did you f felt uh, you, did you did you regret you started the voyage while you were out there? No, not at all. There were definitely times when I'd ask myself, "What are you doing, you silly girl? What did you get yourself in for?" But um, I could always answer my own question. I could always tell myself, "I know why you're doing this." Uh, but the other thing is, you know, you're down there in the middle of the Southern Ocean. You might be weeks away from land or help. You can't just say, "Okay, I've had enough now." There's no easy option. The fastest way to get home is to keep going. I saw the video from Ellen McCarter, she was crying a lot of times. Did you cry? Did you? Yeah, but yeah. you know, I cry back home too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a girl, we cry. <laughs> um, you know, there were very, very tough times. There were times when I was homesick, you know, lonely. It's, it's not easy, but um, I had a lot of good days. And if there is one thing I'm very proud of is how much fun I had out there. What about, um, you said that the toughest part was the at the end of the... Um, One of the toughest parts. The biggest waves I saw of the whole voyage were coming back under Australia, uh, almost home. Uh, but one of the worst the worst storm we did have was in the Atlantic Ocean and we were, the boat was knocked down or rolled over, rolled upside down four times um, during that night and we saw wind gusts over 70 knots. Wow. And did you stay outside then or inside? No, um, the safest place to be obviously when the boat's being knocked down is, is down below. So we're down below with the boat closed up and uh, Pink Lady being a very strong boat basically looked after herself and my job was just to wait it out. And uh, what about the seasickness? Do you get seasick? <laughs> uh, I'm like everyone, I get seasick sometimes but um, uh, only for the first few days of a passage until you get used to it. Uh, but this time I didn't get seasick because the first few days of that passage was so beautiful and, uh, and calm. What about um, and the food? Um, what kind of food did you bring? Uh, well, I'm not a very good fisherman. I only caught one fish. It's kind of embarrassing. And because my family and my team knew that, um, I had lots of food packed. So uh, lots of long life food, some freeze dried food. Uh, I made my own bread, um, had powdered eggs, and lots and lots of chocolate. And uh, you t talked to you home with the, on the telephone, on satellite telephone? Yes, no, it was very good to have that communication with home. There was, uh, I could talk lots to friends and family uh, and internet, of course, satellite internet, but it did all come at a cost, so you could only use so much. And you also write a, wrote a book while you were sailing. Can well, you tell me? I was writing uh, the blogs as I was going, sort of my diary that I would send home and, and share, and, and there was an incredible amount of people from even Germany uh, and Europe uh, following the for the rolling the blogs, which was really lovely uh, to share the voyage with so many people, and uh, it was is a book that inspired me. So it was lovely to be able to, to do that again. And now you are here to show off the book. Yeah, we're here in, uh, in Dusseldorf Boat Show to um, uh, launch the book in uh, in Germany. So I, I hope everyone in Germany enjoys it as well. What kind of language is uh, is it? Germany the first language beside the English? Uh, no, the book's been translated into to French as well, uh, a few different languages. So. Uh, it's cool, yeah, but it's, uh, it is exciting to, to share it with Germans because uh, we did have a lot of support from Germany. And, uh, one of the most interesting parts most people love about the book is the equipment list in the back. Yeah. So every single thing that I took with me is in the, in the list there in the back. Which is, uh, and how did you equip the boat? Uh, is there what is there any failure of the equipment? Yeah, a few things broke, nothing big. Um, the engine did stop for a while, which I was using for some power, the wind generator, electrical problems. I had to keep stitching the sails up when they tore a few times, um, but no very big problems considering. What kind of uh, rig do you have on the boat? What kind of sails did you use? Uh, it's very, it was very simple. Everything was set up, so it was simple and strong and, and unbreakable. Uh, so it was just a, a simple cutter rig um, with a you know, mainsail and a headsail combination. I had a code zero, but no spinnaker, so it was just very, very simple. And yeah, the furling, double yeah. furling, four stay. Uh, no, not double furling, just the furling four stay, and then I used to hang the stay sail or the storm sail on okay. the second four stay, which is good because you need a storm sail that is just hanged on and uh, completely indestructible. And what about the navigation system? Uh, well, like any uh, modern boat, I suppose we had a, a good GPS system, uh, which is what I used around the world. Before I left, I, I learned to navigate by the stars and the sextant, okay. uh, and then we got out there, we just turned the GPS on. <laughs> yeah.